Hello everyone. The discussion in this video is about the gross anatomy of the ear. Ear is an organ of hearing and also it helps to maintain the equilibrium and balance of our body. Generally, human ear has a capacity to observe the frequencies of about 1500 to 3000 hertz per second. In our body, the ear is divided into three parts, external ear, middle ear and the internal ear. This external ear will receive the sound waves and it transmits the sound waves to the tympanic membrane which is present between the external ear and the middle ear. This tympanic membrane is nothing but the eardrum which starts to vibrate according to the sound waves. Now, this vibrations of the tympanic membrane will be transmitted through the ossicles which is present in the middle ear to the internal ear. This internal ear is primarily concerned in converting the sound energy into the nerve energy. So, it transmits the sound energy through the 8th cranial nerve to the brain. Now, the brain will finally help us to perceive the sound. In this way, we are able to hear. Not only this, the semicircular canal which is present in the internal ear is also helps us to maintain the balance and the equilibrium. In such a way, the ear is useful for us. In this part of the video, we are going to discuss about the external ear and its gross anatomy. So, let's go into the video. This picture represents the various subdivisions of the ear. That is the external ear, middle ear and the internal ear and the parts presented within each of these segments of the ear. Let us see the various parts of the segments of the ear. In the external ear, there are the auricle or pinna, the external auditory meatus and the tympanic membrane. The middle ear contains a tympanic cavity. The tympanic cavity contains the auditory ossicles namely the malleus, incus and stapes. This tympanic cavity is connected to the nasopharynx through a pharyngotympanic tube or the auditory tube. So, there is a connection between the ear and the nasopharynx through this auditory tube. The mastoid antrum is also included within the middle ear. In the internal ear, there is the membranous labyrinth enclosed within the bony labyrinth. So, these are the various parts of the ear. External ear. To repeat, the three parts of the external ear are the auricle or pinna, the external auditory meatus and the tympanic membrane. This auricle or pinna is the only part which can be seen from the outside. It is a trumpet-like undulating projection present on either side of the head which collects the sound vibrations from the air. The other two structures that is the external auditory meatus are also called as the external acoustic meatus and the tympanic membrane cannot be seen easily. It can be seen only through an instrument called as otoscope. The external auditory meatus becomes continuous from the bottom of the auricle up to the tympanic membrane. What is this tympanic membrane? This tympanic membrane is also called as the eardrum is a thin semi-transparent membrane which forms a partition between the external acoustic meatus and the middle ear. First, let us consider about the auricle under the following topics. The auricle has two surfaces, lateral surface and a medial surface and these two surfaces has many features. We are going to learn about the various features present in these surfaces. Then about the cartilage of the auricle, then the skin, the muscles and ligaments attached to the auricle, the blood supply, nerve supply and the lymphatic drainage of the auricle. These are the headings under which we have to study about the auricle or the pinna. Basically, the auricle is made up of a single piece of yellow elastic cartilage except at a small portion in the lower part which is called as a lobule and this lobule is made up of fibro fatty tissue. So these two are the pictures showing the lateral surface and the medial surface of the auricle. The lateral surface is otherwise called as the outer surface because when you see from the frontal aspect of a person, the part which is seen is called as the lateral surface which is facing outwards. The other surface which is facing inwards towards the cranium or the skull is called as the medial surface. So it is also called as the cranial surface. The outer or the lateral surface of the auricle presents numerous elevations and depressions. Concha is a large depression which is present in the center. 
that leads into the external auditory meatus. This concha is guarded by a triangular flap of cartilage in front that is called as the tragus. The outermost peripheral rim of the pinna or the auricle is called as the helix. This helix has two limbs, an anterior limb and a posterior limb. The anterior limb will end as the crest of helix which divides the concha or the central large depression into a small upper part and a large lower part. This posterior limb of the helix will continue behind and ends in the lobule or the lower portion of the pinna. The posterior limb in its upper part contains an elevation. This elevation is called as the Darwin's tubercle in its inner aspect. So this Darwin's tubercle is being told as the vestigial part of the pointed part of the quadruped's ear that is four legged animal's ear. Now just anteriorly and running parallel to the helix there is one more prominent ridge that ridge is called as the antihelix. This antihelix encircles the concha. The antihelix has an upper end which divides into two crura. This two crura encloses one triangular depression. This depression is called as the triangular fossa. Similarly, there is one more depression present between the upper part of the antihelix and the helix which is gutter shaped. This depression is called as the scaphoid fossa. So, in the upper part of the pinna, there are two depressions. One is triangular fossa, the other one is the scaphoid fossa. As already told, tragus is a small triangular flap which is present in front of the concha. Just opposite to it, there is one more small elevation called as antitragus. So, tragus is presented anteriorly and antitragus is presented posteriorly. These two are separated by one notch called as the intertragic notch. We know that the concha is a large depression that directs into the external auditory meatus. Just above the crest of the helix, there is one more depression that is called as the simba concha. It is a small area of depression compared to the concha. This simba concha is topographically representing the supramiatal triangle or the McEwen's triangle. The supramiatal triangle is nothing but a depression formed in the squamous temporal bone bounded above by the supramastoid crest, in front by the posterior superior margin of the external meatus and behind by a vertical tangent drawn along the posterior margin of the meatal orifice. The importance of the supramatal triangle is the mastoid antrum lies deep to the supramastoid triangle at a distance of about 12 to 15 millimeters in adult. This triangle becomes one of the most important surgical landmarks for the surgeons when doing mastoidectomy to approach the mastoid antrum. The outer representation of this triangle becomes the symboconca. Lastly, the lower portion of the pinna is called as the lobule which is a skin covered flap of fibro fatty tissue and is devoid of the cartilage. Coming to the medial surface or the cranial surface of the auricle, only two important features are presented there. One is the eminentia concha which is a bulge corresponding to the concha and eminentia triangularis which corresponds to the triangular fossa. Quickly to recap the lateral surface has the following parts they are helix, crest of helix, Darwin's tubercle, antihelix, triangular fossa, scaphoid fossa, tragus, antitragus, intertragic notch, concha, simba concha and the lobule. Two important features in the middle surface are Eminentia concha and Eminentia triangularis. This picture represents the cartilage of the pinna which forms the framework or its skeleton. It is a single piece of yellow elastic cartilage which is crumpled in appearance. It represents one anterior pointed end which is called as the spine of the helix and there is a posterior part which forms the tail of the helix. We can appreciate a small gap between the tragus and the crest of the helix. This gap is deficient in cartilage that is there is no cartilage present in the gap between these two structures. So this gap is called as the incisura terminalis. There is a surgical importance for the incisura terminalis. During surgeries of the external auditory meatus, the incision is being put 
in this region of the incisura terminalis so that it won't cut the cartilage of the pinna. Apart from incisura terminalis, the one more portion which does not have the cartilage is the lobule of the pinna. It is basically made up of the fibro fatty tissue covered by the skin. The cartilage forming the framework of the pinna is covered by the skin which is strongly adherent to it. The skin of the auricle furnishes numerous sebaceous glands which is mostly present in the conca and the scaphoid fossa. Also in case of elderly males there may be coarse hairs projecting out from the tragus, antitragus and the intertragic notch from the skin of the auricle. This kind of uh, representation may be in the expression of the wilinged genes or the wilinged inheritance and that is why it is mostly the feature of the males. The ligaments of auricle are basically of two sets, one is extrinsic, the other one is the intrinsic. The extrinsic ligaments connects the auricle to the other parts of the skull, that is it connects the auricle to the temporal bone through two sets of ligaments, anterior and posterior extrinsic ligaments. The intrinsic ligament will connect the various parts of the cartilage of the auricle itself. They are actually strong fibrous bands that may connect the tragus to the crest of the helix. Some intrinsic ligaments connect the auricle to the external meatus also. Similar to the ligaments, the muscles of the pinna are also extrinsic muscles and intrinsic muscles. The extrinsic muscles are auricularis anterior, auricularis superior and auricularis posterior. The anterior and the superior muscle, they arise from the epicranial aponeurosis and they are inserted to the spine of the helix. The posterior muscle, they arise from the mastoid part of the temporal bone and it is inserted into the eminentia concave present in the medial surface of the pinna. The prime action of the extrinsic muscle is to move the auricle as a whole. The nerve supply is by the temporal branch of facial nerve which supplies the auricularis anterior and the superior while the posterior auricular branch of facial nerve supplies the posterior muscle. The intrinsic muscles basically helps to modify the shape of the pinna. Their action is very minimal in human ears when compared to the quadruped animals. The intrinsic muscles are helicus major, helicus minor, antitragicus, transversus auriculae, obliquus auriculae. The muscles which are present in the lateral surface are supplied by the temporal branch of facial nerve while that present on the medial surface is supplied by the posterior auricular branch of the facial nerve. Blood supply of pinna. The arteries which is going to supply the pinna are basically the branches of the external carotid artery. The posterior auricular artery supplies the medial surface and the posterior part of the lateral surface. The anterior auricular branch of the superficial temporal artery which in turn is a branch of external carotid artery supplies the anterior part of the lateral surface. Occipital artery supplies a small portion of the upper part of the pinna. Venous drainage is through the superficial temporal vein and the external jugular vein. I hope you all remember about the formation of external jugular vein which is by the union of the posterior auricular vein and the posterior branch or division of the retromandibular vein. Pinna is one of the most common site for arteriovenous anastomosis. There are numerous arteriovenous anastomotic channels which are present beneath the skin of the auricle. These channels will dilate when pinna is exposed to cold temperature and hence the skin will go for cracking which is a very painful condition. To avoid this we can see many individuals who cover their pinna with a piece of warm clothing especially to avoid this kind of condition. The nerve supply to the pinna is sensory in nature. The greater auricular nerve supplies the cranial surface and the posterior part of the lateral surface while the lesser occipital nerve supplies the upper part of the medial surface. Both these nerves are branches of the cervical plexus. The branch of the mandibular nerve which is the auriculotemporal nerve supplies the anterior part of the lateral surface while the conca and the eminentia concae are innervated by the auricular branch of the vagus nerve along with few fibers of the facial nerve. Coming to the lymphatic drainage, lymph from the anterior part of the tragus drains into the parotid lymph nodes while from the medial surface into the mastoid lymph nodes. The upper part of the pinna drains the lymph into the upper group of deep cervical lymph nodes. Clinical anatomy of pinna. 
Excision of the neoplastic lesions of the pinna leads to the damage to the skeletal framework or the cartilage of the pinna. But substitution of these cartilages using autologous cartilage materials or alloplastic materials by the surgeons have given very good results when compared to the reconstructive surgeries of the face. In surgical procedures to expose the middle ear or in case of exploratory tympanotomy, an end oral incision is usually made in the incisura terminalis where there is no cartilage. By this manner, the membranous auditory meatus can be expanded without altering the patency of the bony external auditory meatus. Ramsey-Hunt syndrome is a syndrome where the geniculate ganglion of the facial nerve is affected by the herpes zoster infection. Since the auricular branch of the vagus nerve which supplies the upper part of the pinna is communicating with the few fibers of the facial nerve from the geniculate ganglion, this infection also spreads to the pinna. Hence, there will be involvement of pinna also in case of Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. Auricular hematoma is a condition which occurs when there is bleeding within the auricle which results due to trauma. The collection of blood will be formed between the perichondrium and the auricular cartilage which causes distortion of the contour of the auricle. When the condition is untreated, the uh, hematoma will go for fibrosis and forms a deformed auricle which is called as cauliflower or boxes here. The treatment for this condition is the aspiration of blood from the hematoma. The development of auricle occurs during the sixth week of intraeternal life by the proliferation of six mesodermal hillocks. These hillocks fuse to form the definitive auricle. Developmental anomalies of the pinna like preauricular tags, anosia or underdevelopment of pinna, microtia or small pinna, polyosia or mirror pinna have been reported. Preauricular sinus is a developmental deformity of the first and second pharyngeal arches. It occurs as a dent or a dimple or a nodule anywhere in the external ear. This sinus usually is asymptomatic but sometimes it may get infected to form a cyst. Surgical excision of the sinus is usually the treatment of choice. Coming to the next part of the topic, the external auditory meatus which is commonly called as the ear canal. This structure is the one which receives the sound waves and transmits it to the tympanic membrane. We are going to study the external acoustic meatus in terms of the following topics that is the extent, its length, the course of the meatus, the subdivisions, its constrictions, the epithelium lining the meatus, its blood supply and nerve supply. The external auditory meatus extends from the bottom of the concha of the pinna to the tympanic membrane. The cartilage of the external auditory meatus is continuous with the cartilage of that of the pinna. Its length is about 24 mm. The meatus has two parts. It has an outer or lateral one third part which is cartilaginous in nature and it is about 8 mm in length. The inner or the medial two third part is bony in nature and it is 16 mm in length. As already told, the cartilage of the meatus is continuous with the cartilage of the auricle. But in some places, the cartilage is absent or deficient, that is in its upper and the posterior part. Also, in the anterior wall, some two or three fissures are seen in the cartilaginous part of the meatus. Those are called as fissures of Santorini. Through these fissures, infection may spread from the adjacent areas into the external auditory meatus, especially from the parotid gland. The bony part of the meatus is made up of two parts of the temporal bone. The front and below part of the bony part is made up of the tympanic plate of the temporal bone, while above and behind it is made up of the squamous part of the temporal bone. In the medialmost end of the meatus, there is a sulcus called as the tympanic sulcus which occupies the tympanic membrane but in a slightly oblique manner so that the floor and the anterior wall of the meatus is longer than the roof and the posterior wall. This occurs because of the obliquity of the tympanic membrane. The anterior wall of the bony part also has a defect. This defect is presented as a foramen which is called as the hiatus of Hushke. And this foramen is closed by a fibrous membrane. This deficiency occurs because of the incomplete ossification of the tympanic plate of the temporal bone. Not only that, in the newborn period, 
the bony part is not well developed and it is represented as a tympanic ring of bone that is why the external meatus in children is shorter compared to that of the adults due to this ear speculum should not be applied to the children otherwise it will damage the tympanic membrane now we know about the extent the length and the two subdivisions of the external acoustic meatus the meatus courses in a form of an s shaped manner so accordingly it has three parts the outermost part is called as the pars externa which is directed in an upward forward and a medial direction the intermediate part called as pars intermedia courses in an upward backward and medial direction while the innermost part is the pars interna is directed downwards forwards and medially because of this manner of course of the external acoustic meatus it is not easy to see the tympanic membrane as such so the auricle has to be pulled in an upward backward and a lateral direction to make the meatus straight after which through an ear speculum we will be able to visualize the tympanic membrane there are two constrictions along the course of the external acoustic meatus one at the junction of the bony and the cartilaginous part the other one is presented 2 cm deep to the concha in the bony part this second constriction is the most narrowest and it is called as the isthmus in case of any foreign body lodged in the meatus the clearance of these constrictions without causing any injury to the external acoustic meatus becomes an important step during the removal of the foreign body the outer part of the meatus is lined by the skin and is continuous with the skin of the auricle so the lining epithelium is keratinized stratified squamous epithelium while the inner part is same as that of the cuticular layer of the tympanic membrane and the lining epithelium is non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium the cartilaginous part of the meatus contains a specific modified coiled sweat glands those are called as seruminous glands these glands secrete a substance called as cerumen which is commonly called as ear wax most of us try to remove this ear wax with an ear bud but it should not be practiced because this ear wax has some uses it helps to prevent the lining epithelium of the cartilaginous part from becoming macerated because of water also it opposes the entry of the insects and helps to maintain a warm environment for the tympanic membrane to vibrate effectively so in these ways this ear wax is helping us blood supply of the external auditory meatus posterior auricular artery deep auricular branch of maxillary artery anterior auricular branch of the superficial temporal artery these are the arteries supplying the external acoustic meatus these arteries are in turn branches of the external carotid artery The venous blood is drained into the external jugular vein, the maxillary vein and the pterygoid venous plexus. Coming to the nerve supply of the external acoustic meatus, the roof and the anterior wall is supplied by the auriculotemporal nerve which is a branch of the mandibular nerve, while the floor and the posterior wall is supplied by the auricular branch of vagus nerve. These are all sensory nerves. The auricular branch of vagus nerve is given a name it is called as the nerve of alderman it is said that the nerve of alderman is the only cutaneous branch of the vagus nerve the point to be noted few words about the clinical anatomy of the external auditory meatus the meatus is lined by the skin hence boils and infections of the meatus is very common which causes a little swelling but very painful condition This is because the skin is firmly adherent to the underlying cartilage and the bone. The seruminous glands in the meatus sometimes may produce excessive amount of ear wax which causes its accumulation. This condition is called as seruminosis. Because of this, it may try to block the meatus and impede the transmission of the sound vibration. So in this case, the cerumen should be taken out or washed out by syringing with lukewarm water. If this is not done, then this ear wax will try to irritate the auricular branch of the vagus nerve which is also supplying the heart whose action is to decrease the heart rate acute otitis externa is a inflammation of the subcutaneous tissue of the external auditory meatus which causes hearing loss discharge and pain tragal tetanus is diagnostic sign 
The last part to be discussed in the external layer is the tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane is present in the medialmost end of the external acoustic meatus that forms a partition between the external layer and the middle layer. We will discuss the tympanic membrane in terms of its dimensions, the position of the tympanic membrane, its subdivisions, the surfaces of the tympanic membrane, the structure and the recesses present in its mucous membrane, its blood supply and the nerve supply. The tympanic membrane or the eardrum is an oval shaped semi transparent pearly white trilaminar membrane. It is trilaminar in nature because its development is from all the three germ layers the outer layer from the ectoderm, the inner layer from the endoderm, and the middle layer from the mesoderm. Its diameter ranges from 9 to 10 millimeter as maximum and 8 to 10 millimeter to the minimum. It is positioned in an oblique way at an angle of about 55 degree with the floor of the external acoustic meatus. In the newborns, the tympanic membrane is almost horizontally placed. That is why a newborn or a child can withstand a noisy sound when compared to the adults. It is placed in a sulcus called as tympanic sulcus at the medial end of the external acoustic meatus. The tympanic sulcus is a part of the tympanic plate of the temporal bone. This sulcus is deficient in the upper part, so the tympanic membrane is supported by the anterior and the posterior malleolar folds which extend from the lateral process of the malleus which is an ear ossicle to the upper part of the tympanic membrane to support it. The attachment of these two folds divides the tympanic membrane into two parts. So there are two subdivisions of the tympanic membrane. The part which is present above the malleolar folds is called as pars flaccida which is a small triangular lax area. Sometimes this area presents a small perforation. The rest of the membrane below the malleolar folds is called as the pars tensa. As the name implies this part is tense and taut by the attachment of the handle of the malleus and also by the radiating fibers from the intermediate layer of the tympanic membrane. The eardrum has two surfaces. The outer surface facing the external ear is the lateral surface and the inner surface facing the middle ear is the medial surface. The lateral surface is concave and catches the sound waves transmitted through the external acoustic meatus. But the medial surface in contrast it is convex in nature and the point of maximum convexity is called as the umbo. The medial surface gives the attachment to the handle of the malleus. This handle is present between the intermediate and the inner layer of the tympanic membrane. The handle of the malleus is crossed medially by a nerve called as caudal tympani which is a branch of the facial nerve at the junction of the pars flaccida and the pars tensa divisions of the membrane. Coming to the structure of the tympanic membrane. Since it is a trilaminar membrane it has three layers an outer layer, an intermediate layer and an inner layer. The outer layer is called as cuticular layer which is lined by the skin epithelium that is stratified squamous epithelium which is continuous with the lining epithelium of the inner part of the external acoustic meatus. Though this layer is covered with skin it is devoid of dermal papillae. The intermediate layer is called as the fibrous layer because it contains two types of fibers namely outer radiating fiber and the inner circular fibers. The outer radiating fiber diverge from the handle of the malleus to the periphery while the inner circular layer is more towards the periphery compared to the center. These fibers are present in the pars tensa part of the tympanic membrane and that is why this part is short and tense. These fibers are absent in the pars flaccida part of the tympanic membrane. So in the intermediate stratum of the pars flaccida there will be presence of loose connective tissue instead of the fibers. The innermost layer is called as the mucus layer which is lined by the simple columnar or simple squamous epithelium. The upper part alone has a patch of the ciliated columnar epithelium. The inner mucus layer or the mucus membrane of the tympanic membrane presents three spaces or recesses. Those are anterior recess, posterior recess and prusex pouch. The anterior recess is present between the anterior malleolar fold and the handle of the malleus while the posterior recess is present between the posterior malleolar fold and the handle of the malleus while the prusex pouch is a pouch present between the neck of the malleus and the pars flaccida part of the tympanic membrane. Some few points to be noted. 
The pars tensa part of the tympanic membrane is attached to the tympanic sulcus through a fibrocartilaginous rim. This rim is called as the annulus tympanicus. The pars flaccida part of the tympanic membrane is also given in another name called as shrapnel's membrane. In the medial surface of the tympanic membrane, as already told, the point of maximum convexity is called as the umbo. When the tympanic membrane is illuminated from the outside for inspection, there appears a reflected light presented in the antero inferior quadrant of the concavity or the outer surface of the tympanic membrane. This part of the reflected light is called as the cone of light and it radiates from the ombo part of the medial surface. Blood supply of the tympanic membrane. The outer surface of the tympanic membrane is supplied by the deep auricular artery which is a branch of the maxillary artery while the inner surface is supplied by two arteries namely the anterior tympanic branch of the maxillary artery and the posterior tympanic branch which is a branch of a stylomastoid artery which in turn is a branch of the posterior auricular artery. The maxillary artery, the posterior auricular artery are in turn branches of the external carotid artery. The venous blood is drained into the external jugular vein from the outer layer and into the transverse sinus and the pterygoid venous plexus from the inner layer. Nerve supply of the tympanic membrane. In the lateral surface, the anterior and the upper part is supplied by the auriculotemporal nerve which is a branch of the mandibular nerve while the lower and the posterior part of the lateral surface is supplied by the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. The entire medial surface is supplied by the tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve or the ninth cranial nerve through the tympanic plexus. All these are sensory nerves to the tympanic membrane. Clinical anatomy of the tympanic membrane. Inspection of the tympanic membrane by illuminating it through an otoscope gives relevant information about the condition of the middle layer. Since the tympanic membrane is a semi-transparent membrane, we can easily see the malleus and its features through the tympanic membrane. When the tympanic membrane is illuminated, we can appreciate the cone of light presented in the anterior inferior quadrant of the lateral surface of the tympanic membrane. The apex of the cone presents the point of maximum convexity that is the umbo which gives the attachment to the tip of the handle of the malleus. It is easy to appreciate through the semi-transparent tympanic membrane the handle of the malleus which is presented as a yellow streak extending from the umbo upwards and forwards, the lateral process of malleus presented in its upper part and the long process of the incus running parallel to the handle of the malleus behind it. In this way, the middle layer can be inspected through the tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane perforation is a common condition which occurs due to any external injury or due to chronic middle ear infection like auditus media. Sometimes it may also occur due to barotrauma which is a high air pressure that occurs when traveling in higher altitudes. Usually the perforation heals on its own but sometimes it needs a surgical repair like tympanoplasty where the perforation is closed by a graft material taken from the cartilage of the pinna. So the pinna acts as a graft material for the tympanoplastic procedures. Meringotomy is a surgical procedure where a hole is applied to the tympanic membrane to drain the pus formed in the middle ear due to its chronic infection or the auditus media. In this procedure, the surgical incision is applied in the posterior inferior quadrant of the tympanic membrane to avoid injury to the cauda tympani nerve and the ossicles of the ear. This completes the discussion of the external ear and these are all the important points to be noted with respect to the pinna, the external auditory meatus and the tympanic membrane of the external ear. Thank you.